know, the Voyager satellite uh, capsule spacecraft. Um, and bear in mind that those were launched in a specific time frame. They leveraged the position, specific position of uh, planets to use something that is called gravitational uh, uh, slingshot. Those are traveling pretty fast and they would take, they're not going in that direction, but it would take them 70,000 years just to get to the closest star, which is, which is Alpha Centauri again, and 70,000 years to come back. And this is the closest star. Um, why space is important? Uh, the first, well, the main reason, the, the main thing that I want to talk about today is space environment. So the environment in space, uh, I know I, I, I said that we are in space, but as soon as you leave Earth or the atmosphere or ground, you have two things that are pretty substantial. The first one is microgravity. So even though you're orbiting the planet, even though you're floating, it looks like you're floating, you still have around 90% of the gravity that we feel here. The only difference is, is that you're free falling all the time. Um, and the other important aspect is radiation, very high dose of radiation that can, well, in most cases can kill any life form we know of. Um, so, main idea, going to space is horrible <laughs> for your body, but it's very useful if you want to do, for example, research. Now, quick quiz, so just be ready to raise your hand. If something goes bad in space, what do you think is going to be the quickest way in which you can die or in which space is going to kill you? So first option, no oxygen. You cannot breathe because there is no atmosphere. Second option, no, again, no atmosphere, so no pressure. You're like in a vacuum. Third one, cold. As you can read there, <laughs> it's pretty cold. So who is going to vote for one? Option one, no oxygen. Okay. We have one vote. Who's going to vote for no pressure? Okay, okay. And who's going to vote for cold? Okay, that, that's very interesting. Um, cold is deadly. The thing is that in space there is no way, there is a limited way to transfer heat. Uh, convection doesn't work and conduction doesn't work, so it's only radiation, heat radiation. So it might take, well, if you're alive, probably months to die. Um, the other two, <laughs> The other two, so no oxygen, it, it will um, make you blank out. Uh, so that's the most immediate effect, exactly like when in, on an airplane there is no oxygen in the cabin, that, that's the same problem. No pressure will bring all the water in your body, in the cells and so on, to boil it, almost inst instantaneously. So you, you start you know, getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so it, yeah, it's a tie between the, the two of them. And it depends what happens, if it's only a glove that is coming off or if it's the whole suit that is disappearing, whatever. Um, so a uh, few problems of going to space. It's hard, dangerous, and expensive, as we said last time. Um, and yeah, for example, Apollo missions were 50-50 chance of surviving, everybody surviving or everybody dies. Two unfortunate um, disasters at the bottom. Uh, and well, expensive because you know they're bringing anything to space. Uh, is around $35,000 per pound. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's quite difficult. However, as I was talking with someone before, there are so many benefits of doing research in space. These are some of the technologies we developed in space. Uh, one of them is, well, the sensor that is now filming myself. Uh, so CMOS sensors, uh, solar panels, and a bunch of medical devices. And we are gonna talk about medical devices very soon. This is what we haven't covered last time. So. If you want to do any kind of biomedical and pharmaceutical research in space, that's probably the best opportunity we have. These are some of the topics, the bottom ones, we are not gonna discuss them, we can have a chat later. Starting with drug, de drug development. Just a second, it takes some, some time. So the main idea with drug development is that the fact that you don't have gravity, well, you have gravity but you don't feel gravity, allows you to build much more uniform protein. So there is a process which is very common, which is called protein crystallization. And as you can see on Earth, you have all these yellow things that are not very homogeneous. You know, the structure is not symmetrical and it's all messed up. As soon as you switch to uh, an experiment or dr drug development and protein crystallization in space, because there are no vibration, no gravity messing up and, and stuff like that, the, sorry, the crystals are much higher quality. And we're gonna touch in a few seconds on why that is important. Yeah. 
So this is the benefit. The other one is age-related issues. So the two elements I was talking before, microgravity and radiation, is pushing your body to the limits, is making you age much quicker. Um, if you spend around six months in space, for your body is the equivalent of aging 10 years. Um, and that's why, for example, this is a stationary bike. I know, <laughs> I know it doesn't look like because he has straps, like a backpack and stuff like that. But the reason why they need to train three hours per day is to kind of counteract these negative effects and not age as quickly. Uh, on the flip side, it's a great opportunity if you want to study anything related to aging. So Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, osteoporosis, so you know, uh, bones getting weaker with age and, and stuff like that because you get results 20 times faster. So it's, it, it's positive if you stay here. <laughs> Same thing with viruses and bacteria. Uh, so exactly like we under stress, viruses and, and bacteria are under stress as well. And so they become much more aggressive. Um, it looks like there's obviously a lot, of, a lot of research needed, but it looks like they get more contagious which is horrible, again, if you're in space, but if you want to develop, for example, antiviral treatment for COVID, then when you bring the same treatment on Earth, then it's much more effective. And what you see here is, a, is an experiment that was on the ISS. The astronaut is um, injecting a flu shot, flu vaccination uh, in space. This is what I was talking about before, the crystallization. So this is a very real life example. What you see here is the top selling drugs were white, Number one is Keytruda. It's an anti-cancer treatment by a company called Merck, which is the second biggest pharmaceutical company in the world. The IP was expiring, and they were um, on the edge of losing the IP, which means obviously losing the revenue and, and stuff like that. So they said, okay, what can we do to improve the, the drug? They went to space, and what you see from the, I know it's, uh, it's a bit confusing, but the top row is, uh, is the drug developed on Earth, and you see very big chunks and not very homogeneous. So you have empty space and big chunks on another side. The one at the bottom, it's what was developed in space. So much more homogeneous, much more uniform. And they did that in space, improved the, uh, the quality of the molecule. And now instead of being, well, it depends, but it can be between one hour, the infusion that you see on, on top, or if you have, if you have cancer, um, between one hour and sometimes almost a day, now it's a one shot. It's like a vaccination. So it's a definitely a big improvement on, on the life of the patient, but also for yeah, economical reasons. Are they able to manufacture that in Earth, or does it have to be manufactured? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, they can do it here. Uh, but the, the main goal is now, and we're going to touch on, on next slide, the, the main goal is to manufacture in space. And, and this is a great hook because there is a company called Redwire that went to space to try to solve another problem, which is organs you know, organ donation, which is obviously lack, lackluster. Um, and they were successfully able to print a meniscus, which is, a, you know, the kneecap uh, in space. And it has so many benefits simply because you don't have gravity that is any kind of, any time you try to 3D print a soft tissue on Earth, the gravity is like making it collapse on itself. If you do that in space, it's so much easier. Uh, this is what they did last year. Other reason, uh, climate, uh, we were talking about that probably a little bit earlier, but um, I know space is often you know, accused of being not very uh, eco-friendly or yeah, sustainable. Uh, one of the ways we need to, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that out of probably 60 parameters that we track for climate change, I think 58 of them, so almost all of them, are tracked uh, from space. So this is something very important. And the other thing to keep in mind is uh, space, as any other industry, is obviously polluting, like uh, probably you know, building a building like this or having the pizza we just had. Uh, it's a matter of you know, uh, finding the, the pros and cons of having this kind of, kind of activity. So the bottom left, I know it's a little bit small, but I'll guide you through that. The bottom left is the number of launches we have per year. That is like 200 launches per year, more or less. The one in the middle is the number of um, commercial airline flights we have every year, uh, which is around between 35 and 40 million per year. 
And the last one is the number of cars only in the US, which is 300 million. So, and this to say that using this kind of vehicles obviously pollutes, not the one in the center because that engine is only on hydrogen. So what you see, the, the white trail, the white smoke is water vapor, which is still dangerous because if you put water vapor in higher atmosphere, it takes ages to dissipate. But what I'm trying to say is that probably one of the most polluting factor of space is what you see on the top right. So manufacturing the rockets, but exactly like manufacturing a car or manufacturing airplanes. That's why, for example, SpaceX is really helping on that because they are reusing the rockets. Yeah, I think space is great. These are probably the reason why, the most common reason why people think space is great. So the top left is a GPS, which allows us to make, well, obviously apart from navigation and positioning, but it also allows us to make digital payments. Uh, so whenever you, you withdraw money from an ATM, it goes through the GPS, or every time you make an electronic payment, bank transfer, whatever, goes through the GPS. Bottom left is telecom uh, satellites. The one in the center is disaster management, so that's, a, that's an earthquake. Every time you see a switch in colors, it's, it, it's, it's like a topography map, so it's showing the the rate of change in terms of ground movement. So the, the, the closer it becomes, the, the, you know, the, the closer the lines are. Uh, well, in the center is precision agri agriculture because it's getting easier and easier to do that. Weather and earth observation. A uh, little bit about analog astronauts. So a lot of the research we do in space is actually possible to do also on earth. Uh, not the, the kind of biomedical and pharmaceutical research I was talking about, but everything apart from that. So testing suits, testing vehicles, you know, testing procedures, food, whatever. And these are some pictures of analog astro missions before the Apollo missions. Uh, done all of them in, in the US, obviously, Hawaii and Arizona. And this is what we have done in, in Hawaii last year, which is an analog astro mission similar to that, not funded by NASA, unfortunately. Uh, there was an accident on, in a mission previous to ours, and yeah, the, the funding got cut. We are organizing a new set of uh, missions in Italy, analog astro missions, with the goal of really changing life of people on Earth. So we want to focus on experiments and activities that actually bring something real, you know, a new product, new business, new software, new material, whatever, uh, and not only academic research. Uh, I was talking about biomedical and pharmaceutical research. I'm the co-founder of a company, just briefly. Um, it's called Frontier Space Technologies, and we have this box that is capable of doing this kind of research. That's it. Uh, and this is the scene behind the analog astro missions. That's it. for the analog astro missions in Italy? Any, any? Yeah, yeah. So there are around 12 um, habitats worldwide. I think a couple of them are from space agencies, so are off limits for civilians. All the others are self-funded, self-organized. Most of them are related to universities. Um, so for example, astronauts are not professional there. Most of the time, the astronauts are paying for it, you know, being part of the mission. Um, rarely, there are companies that are willing to pay some of the expenses just to have the experiments done during the mission, but yeah, most of them are very tight on budget. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's the, on Mauna Lea. Uh, there are two big volcanoes. Uh, we are on one of them, and we could see the other one in front of us. I had to, yeah, yeah. And in fact, for, and this is a big problem, uh, because one of the limitations of doing these kind of uh, experiments is that one of the things we cannot replicate is the long duration missions. Um, these missions are usually between a week and two weeks, so very, very short. In order to get some results in terms of isolation and psychological effects and so on, it should be at least probably, I don't know, a year or two years. The thing is that Nobody's, well, it is difficult to find people that are capable of spending 100K to 100K per year just to attend these kind of missions. 
and that's why they are getting shorter and shorter. Yes, that's a great question. Uh, probably the most honest answer is that we don't know. Uh, but yeah, th that's a great question. And that's why, for example, anything related to reproduction in space, uh, so having babies, it's uh, controversial. Uh, and, and that's, for example, why historically astronauts have been selected to be not too young. Uh, it's rare, especially in the past, to see 20 years old astronauts. And one of the reasons is, you know, the possibility of developing cancer in their lifetime. Um, if they are 20 years old, they have, I don't know, 60 years in front of them in which they could develop cancer as a result of the space mission. So you're right. But I guess, I guess we don't know. Yeah, definitely. No, no, no. So just to give you an idea, if we go to Mars, if you stay on the surface of Mars, most likely you would be dead in two weeks. Uh, and you need several feet, tens of feet of ground above you to, to, to shield that. The more the better. So if it's a mountain, it's even better. Yeah. But one, sorry, one good idea is to actually use water as a great radiation filter, radiation shield, sorry, not filter. So the idea is to use to store all the water around the spacecraft because you need to carry water anyway. So the idea is to create a, you know, a layer of water around the spacecraft. But sorry. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not a filter. My, it, it, it's used as a shield because you could use lead, but there's no use for lead. So you know, it's. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> go for it, go for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if anybody has experience in, you know, in the finance sector, one of the big problems is that um, you, want to, you want to prevent people from making the same payment twice. So if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you want to prevent people from paying, I don't know, 500 or 1000 in a shop, and one second later, 1000 in, in the shop next to that. Uh, that's why historically we have been using GPS atomic clocks uh, to precisely measure time, and, and and that's what they are providing. In fact, it's not they don't provide um, uh, location; they provide time. So, and by by knowing where the satellites are and what's the time delay, how long does the signal take to take to get to your place, then you can find the three-dimensional position. But time is the fourth dimension that is very important in GPS. Yeah. Do you, you want to say something, say something right? Well, I think what you were saying is very consistent. Lead had no other use. I'm sorry, we all had no other use. Yeah. With a shield of radiation, yeah. you might be still getting radiation. Do you get, do you get radiation? Uh, I, I think it depends on the type of radiation we are talking. I know that, I know that like in nuclear reactors, they have ways, I'm, I'm not, I know nothing about, you know, it's not my expertise, but I know they have ways of turning the water into drinkable again. I don't know how it's done, but it's a technology we have somehow. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one of the, that I'm very excited about uh, that we want to really push forward is to grow plants on lunar and reg sorry lunar and Martian soil, uh, which is typically called regolith. Uh, but that, that's something very promising, and I know it's a bit different from what the Martian, the, the you know the movie and the book represent, but that that's something that we're really looking forward to, uh, and and compared, for example, to hydroponics. So growing plants in without soil, but directly into water. Um, yeah, there are so many, so many different. Uh, go for it.
Yeah. 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 Um, so first of all, let's keep in mind that timelines in space are most of the time are, are fake. So NASA wanted to have a colony on Mars by I think 1982. We don't have it yet. So first of all, second, you're right. Politics is a big factor, and that's why, for example, we're putting so much more money on the moon rather than on Mars because Mars has so many unknowns, which is you know, difficult to judge. My view on this is that it's like, imagine being on Earth, and instead of being such a big planet, you're a small island in the middle of the ocean. Sorry, in the ocean. And what you see around you is a bunch of other islands, which are, you know, the other planets in our system, or other stars. And you see them, because they're outside. If you just go out after this chat and you look up, you see many stars and many planets. Are you willing to stay on your small island for forever? So I, I think that humans are, you know, naturally inclined to explore and to find new, new places to visit and, and stuff like that, exactly like Europeans decided to came here a few hundred years ago. Without that, we wouldn't have the US. So for me, it's a natural way of thinking that sooner or later we'll get to Mars. Um, what you touched on, so that the, the cost, it's, it's right. Um, I was chatting before on the fact that now we are spending 0.3% of the GDP on space program, public. Uh, so it means that 99.7% of the GDP is spent on something else, which I, I wouldn't say that we're putting a lot of money into space. Uh, and the, the other reason is, and the reason why I think China wants to go there, is the economical return you, you have from doing that. So in the first chat we had together, I mentioned the fact that for every dollar historically, so we don't know about the future, but historically for every dollar spent in, on space, the return was seven, seven dollars. So it's not a few percent, it's like uh, 600%. Um, so that, that's a reason. If we talk about moon, uh, it has even more reasons if we start doing fusion, uh, nuclear fusion because there is a lot of deuterium on, on the surface, sorry, uh, not deuterium, helium-3, uh, which is a great fuel if you want to do fusion. And it's free, it's already there, we can simply collect it and, and use it. And just a small, you know, espresso cup uh, could power probably a country for decades. So you just need a little bit to, to go a long way. So that, that's why, and, but I, I guess that all this is also related. I, I think that every country now understands this, Every country wants to be the top in, in you know, medical devices, in, you know, uh, for example, optics, um, fiber optics, because I think we're all uh, familiar with that. Um, the quality of the fiber optics you can, you can have if you manufacture them in space is so much higher than, than here. So that's another reason. And semiconductors is another, another big one for manufacturing in space. So, you know, many different applications uh, and benefits. Yeah, so, sorry, long answer, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so there are at least two commercial space stations that are now getting designed and eventually built. Uh, probably the most promising one is the one by Axiom, Axiom Space, uh, and the other one was a consortium. Now, I'm not sure about the progress, but it was a consortium between uh, Boeing, uh, Sierra Space, uh, and Blue Origin, and other smaller entities. Um, and when we talk about commercial space station, it can be anything. So a big one was entertainment. So having concerts and movies actually, you know, filled in space, for example. Uh, but I guess manufacturing is going to be another one. There is a pretty loud, I would say, startup here in the U.S., uh, which is called Varda. And uh, they just returned a space car that was designed to manufacture drugs in space. So things are moving. Yeah, probably not as fast as they should, but yeah. Yeah, somewhat, somewhat related. I, I 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how's that industry like in one traditional now? It's basically companies like bid for a slot and a, a module on the wall and like can the app shop do the experiment or is that Yeah. Like I said, how's that work? Yeah, uh, it's, I think it's, uh, it's very difficult for companies because you're right. Uh, you need to bid for, and this is a, this is a nice, uh, it's a time lapse of the astronaut actually mounting stuff inside the ISS. Um, it's very difficult and it's one of the problems we're trying to solve. Whenever you want to do an experiment, you need to wait for an, a call to open and then apply for that and then wait for the launch to be launched and then, you know, the experiment and it, come, it comes back. Usually it can be 10 years from when you start until when you get the results. Um, what we're trying to do is to, you know, have a small cap, sorry, small box that is automating everything so you don't need to have, you know, uh, people doing anything or um, you can simply have the same box doing more than one experiment. Astronauts, as we said last time, are one of the limiting factors of doing research in space because their time is very expensive. Uh, it's between 100K and 400K per hour, uh, which is not the salary. They have between, <laughs> no, it, no, it's important. It's between, I think between 60 and 70,000 per year on average, the salary, so average, but the cost of their time is a few hundred, thousand per hour. Yeah. <laughs> and actually talking about most expensive thing, one of the interesting things is that there is a allocation around each planet which is called geostationary or stationary orbit. Um, that's the most expensive piece of real estate you can get. Uh, and the reason is, is very simple. Whenever you put something in that orbit is rotating around the planet at the same speed as the planet is rotating on itself. This is very useful because it means you have always have a satellite above you at any time. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, it's, uh, I love science. Um, so if you ask entrepreneurs, they, they want to build mega constellations because they're useful. Um, I, I really love science. So everything you put it up there has an impact on astronomical observation you can do. Um, however, the best telescopes we have are not on Earth. Uh, so because you're above that cloud of, you know, small satellites and whatever, you're getting rid of some of the problems. My dream personally, would be to have a telescope array on the dark side of the moon. So, you know, the moon is rotating, but it's always facing one face to us. So there's always one face of the moon that is always away from us. Uh, and this is very useful if you're do doing like radio uh, astronomy. So not using visible light, but radio. Uh, and this is very useful because you have a, a huge planet. I, I know it's not a planet, but it, it's, it's kind of a planet. It is blocking all the electromagnetic, you know, interference from Earth in terms of, you know, TVs, radios, uh, cellular communication, or whatever. So that, that's my dream. But. <laughs> Yeah, it's, in, it's not going to be a, 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 probably an impact on our capability of, you know, watching the stars because it's not visible to the naked eye. Right. So even now there are like uh, 5,000 Starlink satellites, but we don't see them, you know, when you, when you watch the sky. Yeah. 
No, no, no. Yeah, it happens, but you don't see thousands of them. Uh, most of the time is when they launch them, they still need to get into the right position or you know, inclination, whatever. So I, I agree with you. Uh, I think it's one of the cons of having commercial space happening. Um, as soon as you put money into it, there are companies that, are, that want to profit from that, and Starlink is profitable. Um, yeah, it's, but, but it's the same thing here on Earth, uh, unfortunately. So if you look at, I don't know, um, internal cables underground or, you know, it, it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, fortunately. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so up to 800 kilometers, which is like 500 miles above ground, you still have a little bit of atmosphere. And this means that satellites are naturally decaying. So instead of being there for forever, for tens of billions of years, they slowly slow down and burn up in the, in the atmosphere. And that's one of the ways in, in which Starlink is a little bit more sustainable than other satellite constellations because they're so low that in three, four years, they're already um, you know, disposed of. Uh, so it's not that bad. Now the big question that is, is arising in this month, so I'm happy because I'm updating you on the most updated thing is what's the impact of burning up so many satellites in the atmosphere? Uh, because they, they enter, they, they, they sublimate, so they, they convert from solid to gas instantaneously. They don't go through the liquid phase. Uh, but it means there is metal dust in, in the atmosphere, and we don't know what happens, so yeah. Now, now the problem is that we have a, at least between 50, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have between 50,000 and 100,000 objects above a few inches, and some of them are like school buses in size, and they are dead, uncontrollable, and they, if they hit each other, it's it's going to be you know a domino effect because it's going to be a cloud of debris that is going to hitting everything else. So. At least it's not making the problem worse. This is what I mean. Yeah. <laughs>